tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Hey, where should I go? Come on, coppers, tell me. Where should I go? On the move, illegal campers forced out of Vancouver's Crab Park quickly find another place to pitch up. Also, we should have been able to have some contact as a family. The push to loosen the rules for visitors at BC long-term care homes and... The washrooms were closed. They were off limits to everyone. No place to go. The pandemic highlights the need for more public washrooms. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good, Good evening. evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Dozens of police moved in on people living in a tent city near Crab Park on Vancouver's waterfront early this morning. As Eva Uguensend reports, this is the third time in just over a month the campers have been forced to move, and now they've set up at another park a few kilometers away. Hey, where should I go? Frustration and desperation clear on the faces of campers this morning. Police moved in to enforce a court injunction, evicting people from property owned by the Vancouver Port Authority. And I say, where do I go? They say, just not here. Campers say the Port Authority promised them housing supports would be on site today. The Port Authority was lying to people. They were trying to pacify people. And then the cops just so show up at 6 a.m.? Campers scrambled to gather their belongings. There was chaos, like people running around. All in an effort to move across the downtown east side to Strathcona Park. So I just started helping backing up. That's all I could do. Vancouver Park staff at Strathcona were waiting to warn campers about safety concerns from falling deadwood and the park's automatic sprinklers. But some are disappointed in the lack of dialogue from other levels of government. For the first time, one level of government is coming and talking about how to keep people safe. So how is it that Mayor Stewart and John Horgan and Justin Trudeau and the Port of Canada and Canada aren't at the same level? Earlier this year, the province did find housing for 261 people living at Vancouver's Oppenheimer Park Tent City but some chose not to take it, continuing to live on the streets instead. Uh, we're now looking and we're acquiring permanent locations so none of those people will go back to the street um, in, in the future. Uh, and that work is ongoing. Uh, we're investing in that uh, very much. We need the federal government to come to the table uh, and invest. But Brett feels the housing options given just aren't good enough. There needs to be low barrier SROs, there needs to be no barrier SROs that are just affordable housing for students and employed people. And then we need sober places with a bit more support. Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart is putting it on the federal government, calling on it to step up. If Ottawa came to the table, he says, we would be able to drastically increase the amount of housing we're able to provide. The city is ready with land. The province is ready with funding and services. Until then, it's not clear whether campers now settled at Strathcona will be forced to move from there too. But the park board does say the area needs to remain accessible and safe for other city residents too. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. A new outbreak has been confirmed in BC's fight against COVID-19. This one at Langley's Maple Hill long-term care facility. Still, for the fourth day in a row, no one has died here of the disease. The death toll in BC still stands at 170, while 11 new cases push the total caseload to 2,756. 11 people are in hospital, five in the ICU. A little more than 2,400 people who tested positive have now recovered. There are currently 172 active cases across the province. Health Minister Adrian Dix says the province is stockpiling PPE now to make sure the health care system is prepared for a potential second wave of cases. And if you're thinking about a trip stateside anytime soon, you're going to have to change those plans. The border between Canada and the U.S will remain closed to all non-essential traffic until at least July 21st. This coming after Ottawa announced allowing some immediate family members of Canadians to come and visit. 
It's the third time the closure has been extended since the two countries agreed to put the closure in place back in March. There is mounting pressure from business groups and border communities to reopen the border, but Prime Minister Trudeau isn't offering any clues about when the restrictions may be lifted. Well, BC's seniors advocate is hoping visitors will soon be welcome in long-term care homes. Right now, only essential visits are allowed. As Andrea Ross reports, one woman says the rules made saying goodbye to her father very difficult. It didn't make sense to me. Last month, Jennifer Page said goodbye to her father in a long-term care home in Trail. Although his death was not related to COVID-19, she wasn't allowed to comfort her mother just down the hall. She was very confused why she saw members of her family walking past her and going into her husband's room. COVID-19 restrictions mean only essential visits are allowed in long-term care homes. BC's seniors advocate Isabel McKenzie would like to see these rules loosened. I'm hoping that we will see a change to the visitor policy in the very, very near future. She acknowledges there are health risks in allowing visitors, but the isolation also carries a heavy toll. We have to find a way for families to be able to connect meaningfully with their loved ones in long-term care, especially over situations like shared grief. Long-term care homes have been particularly hard hit by COVID-19. Some outbreaks have been declared over, including one just yesterday at Vancouver's Granville Park Lodge. But the virus isn't gone. Today, Fraser Health announced a new case at the Maple Hill Long-Term Care Home in Langley. Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry says increasing contact while keeping seniors safe is a delicate balance and no solution comes without risk. It is the most challenging question that we have because, you know, it's a balancing of, of quality of life all around and it's not a simple question. A balanced page wonders if the province is getting right and if it's happening fast enough. Is it fair for them to spend their last days, months, who knows how long this will go on, alone and locked away from their families? Um, is that really a fair thing to do? Is that going to, does that make them happy? Does that make everyone happy? It's left her family with more questions than answers. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. As the economy starts to reopen and the weather turns better, more people are spending time outside. And the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need for more public washrooms. As Tina Lovegreen explains, when nature calls, there just aren't that many places to go. Vancouver taxi driver Kulvan Sahoda hasn't stopped working during the pandemic. Well, we have passengers that actually rely on us. They don't have transportation uh, available making sure he gets people to where they need to go. But his own needs have been a challenge. There's hardly any places uh, you can go to. Washrooms drivers are used to walking into are now closed. You had everybody, the gas stations, you had uh, the Tim Hortons, every place. Uh, the washrooms were closed. They were off limits to everyone. With more businesses reopening, there are more places to go, but they're limited to places like grocery stores and dine-in restaurants. We have a timer that goes off every 15 minutes. Door handles, everything inside is disinfected. That pretty much ensures that once a customer has left the washroom, that it's being cleaned. But depending on private businesses for something so basic, leaves many without access. People are spending more time just seeking out the basics, like a washroom, and they have less access to hygiene rather than more during a pandemic. Some cities have set up portables, but this journalist and author argues there need to be more public washrooms. They're expensive in terms of capital investment. They can be expensive in terms of ongoing maintenance. With regard to COVID, there is additional cleaning that needs to be done, um, and that all costs money. But many argue money worth spending for a basic human need. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Another Vancouver statue has been defaced. This time, it's Gastown's Gassy Jack. The statue of Gassy Jack was hit with red paint overnight. Crews were on scene this morning, spraying off the bronze tourist straw. 
Gazi Jack has been getting negative attention amid the Black Lives Matter movement and the growing re-examination of historical figures. There's now a petition to remove Gassy Jack's statue due to his treatment of indigenous people and taking a 12-year-old child as his wife. A major court ruling finds hosts are not responsible for the actions of their guests. A Salt Spring Island teen was left with life-altering injuries after he and a teenage friend left a party back in 2012. The teens had consumed alcohol and used marijuana at the birthday party. As they left, they stole a car parked nearby and ended up getting into a major crash that left the driver dead. A survivor who sustained severe injuries sued the two parents who hosted the birthday party, claiming they had been negligent. The judge found they were not legally responsible. A Burnaby man has been charged after a deadly crash involving a pedestrian. 40-year-old Roberto Francisco is accused of criminal negligence and impaired driving causing death. On June 7th, police responded to reports that someone had been hit by a car on Lougheed Highway. The 69-year-old victim was declared dead at the scene. Check in now with meteorologist Brett Soderholm. Very strange today, Brett. Blue sky and some yellow object up there in the sky. <laughs> it's just so different. I know. I uh, was kind of caught off guard a little bit, needed to fumble around for my sunglasses and remember what it's like to feel that sun on my face. It feels like it has been so long, but because of all of that sunshine, the temperatures have certainly rebounded back to where they should be, even still a little bit on the cool side. But take a look where we're sitting at right now across the lower mainland. A far cry from where we were at this time yesterday, only getting up to 14 degrees. Now we're up to about 18 degrees at the airport, 20 degrees in Pitt Meadows. And this is actually some of the warmest air that we've seen this week and you can tell by today's high temperatures other places like Squamish already getting up to 20 degrees and if we look over on Vancouver Island places there as well enjoying some of that warmth in Nanaimo 21 but you can see quite the difference between Victoria Airport in Sydney versus downtown Victoria which at the harbor was closer to 15 but other places into the Okanagan as well benefiting from a little bit of that warmth Kelowna there 23 degrees and this trend is going to be continuing on for the next couple of days and I've got some good confidence with that so as we look ahead here in Vancouver for the next couple of hours it's going to be much the same that's a decent amount of sunshine all the way until sunset which is about 9 20 i believe by this time tonight now tomorrow we're going to be looking at another very similar day with lots of sunshine expected as early as first thing in the morning but lasting through to the afternoon as well and as always a psa please wear your sunscreen if you're going to be outside because the uv index is going to be very high all right thanks very much brent well, a big concession for restaurants and bars in B.C., the government will allow them to buy liquor at wholesale prices rather than retail. It'll save them about 20 percent. It's a move the restaurant industry has been asking for a while now, but it was COVID that got the government to change the rules. The new prices will kick in next month and will last until March when they will be reassessed. Later on in the program, we will talk to Ian Tostenson. He's president of the BC Restaurant and Food Services Association, and he'll tell us why this is a huge help. And of course, just a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. That is our free app where you can also find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And we're on Instagram and Twitter as well, so give us a follow. Coming up, evidence a drug can improve COVID-19 survival, reducing deaths by up to one third. How it works and what happens next, that's coming up. And thanks for staying with us in our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, as people look for ways to support the black community amid protests sparked by George Floyd's death, a creator on Instagram is trying to bring more attention to businesses owned by black people. As Talia Ricci tells us, some shop owners are already noticing a difference. So Auntie Lucy's Burgers is a smash beef burger shop. We opened June 3rd and it's, it's been off to a great start. Chief Basampra says a post promoting his business on black-owned Toronto helped. She was, you know, one, basically our first uh, uh, supporter 
in this whole time period. And it really just got the ball rolling for us. In the beginning of the year, one of my biggest goals was to start supporting more Black-owned businesses. This is an opportunity just to be an amazing ally to the Black community. Shopping with us, um, you just help our families. You help us increase generational wealth. You help bring customers our way. You just help us flourish overall. The photographer and graphic designer says the growing account is now her full-time focus. I purchased this for the first time at a natural hair convention. For a long time, we, there's been so many black businesses that haven't gotten attention. And I think now that the conversation is in hand, it's very important to bring those people to the light. It's really important now more than ever because people are watching. The Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce launched last year and they also have a directory of businesses. Their goal is to provide resources and host events that help black entrepreneurs succeed. You need to know that there are other people out there that look like you that are doing what you're doing. Barrett says the chamber is pushing for more data collection on black owned businesses across the country. As a chamber, we're interested in knowing what your board of directors looks like. We're interested in knowing what your supply chain looks like. And also looking for this support to remain steady. I just don't want this to be a temporary trend. I do want supporting black owned businesses and supporting local businesses in general to become like more of a lifestyle. A lot of people are just have been struggling. So this moment right here is very important and Karen is helping by posting it and giving everyone some shine. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Well, some members of the royal family have made their first appearances since the coronavirus lockdown began in March. Prince Charles and Camilla resumed public engagements, visiting with hospital workers and expressing their appreciation. It's been a marvelous opportunity just to have a chance of seeing people who I know have been doing so much on the, literally on the front line and having to endure an awful lot of stress and strain, I think, in their wonderful way. How they do it, I don't know. The couple respected physical distancing rules as they met with medical staff at Gloucester Royal Hospital. The 71-year-old prince, of course, recovered from a mild case of COVID-19 back in March. Prince William, meanwhile, visited paramedics, thanking them for their response. They're part of a service that provides round-the-clock emergency care for millions of people in eastern England. The quest for a COVID-19 vaccine is still very much a marathon, but researchers may have just cleared a major hurdle for treating the disease. And as Christine Birak tells us, it's all because of a cheap drug that already exists and is easy to get. For the sickest COVID-19 patients who are no longer able to breathe on their own, the drug dexamethasone offers a glimmer of hope. This is the first medicine that's been shown to reduce death in any group with COVID, and that's the start of something. In a large clinical trial, UK scientists gave 2,000 COVID-19 patients a low dose of dexamethasone. Results suggest the drug saved one life for every eight patients on a ventilator and saved one life for every 25 receiving oxygen. I'm just totally grateful and will be for the rest of my life. Catherine Milbank spent 12 agonizing days on a ventilator before receiving the drug. She left the hospital on her 55th birthday. I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be alive, so thank you. Doctors worldwide are excited about this development. This drug is a common corticosteroid often prescribed to patients with arthritis and asthma. It's available in every hospital pharmacy and it's cheap. The only problem is researchers haven't yet released their data so that it can be reviewed. I think there will be some devil in the details when the final publication comes out. It's very hard to practice medicine from press release. Still, Britain's health minister has granted doctors permission to start giving the drug to all severely ill COVID-19 patients. Canada's top doctor isn't there yet. It's very important for us to actually examine the results uh, very carefully uh, before making any uh, further recommendations. We're not talking about some trivial outcome. But some doctors say they won't wait. I think that most clinicians who become aware of this study are going to start using it today. 
Doctors emphasize dexamethasone won't protect anyone from becoming infected with COVID-19, but they hope it will be the first of many drugs that will save lives. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Canada's emergency response benefit is officially getting extended. But as David Cochran reports tonight, this time around, there will be more conditions. Over the past few months, Canadians have been able to count on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. That benefit has been a lifeline for more than 8 million Canadians, but for many it runs out next month. So an extension of eight more weeks. So if you've been getting the CERB and you still can't work because you're unable to find a job or it's just not possible, you will keep getting that $2,000 a month. I feel relieved. I feel um, safer. I mean, I owe... I so grateful to live in Canada. Asia Sachs works in a Toronto restaurant. Even as the hospitality sector inches back to normal, many workers still don't have a job to go back to or can't get enough hours to live without the CERB. I will absolutely need that, and I'm by no means the only one. Um, even with restaurants slowly reopening, we're seeing uh, very few people actually being hired back. But while the checks won't change, the conditions will. When people sign up for the CERB, they will have to promise to look for work. We are going to have stronger language in the attestation that encourages, even expects, workers to look for work, take work when it's reasonable for them to do so. Emergency benefits weren't the only thing extended today. So was the emergency closure of the Canada-U.S. border, sealed now to non-essential travel until at least late July. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Mexico may stop farm workers from coming to Canada this summer. The move comes after two Mexican temporary foreign workers died of COVID-19. As Olivia Stefanovic tells us, hundreds more have become infected here. This cell phone video, taken at an undisclosed location, shows the cramped quarters some of Canada's temporary foreign workers are forced to endure. Twelve workers bunked in a room, their beds only separated by thin pieces of cardboard. No space for physical distancing here. Nobody should be left to contend with conditions like that. Human rights lawyer Shane Martinez posted the video online after news hundreds of Mexican migrant farm workers tested positive for COVID-19. Two of them died. When a worker gets sick, their employer is supposed to take them to the hospital immediately. Unfortunately, that is not always happening. I spoke with uh, President uh, Lopez Obrador uh, just a couple of days ago. We uh, touched on this topic. I shared my uh, sympathies and condolences. The Prime Minister acknowledged the situation needs to change in the short and long term. We can even look at things like pathways towards citizenship that could uh, give people more rights. In the meantime, the federal government is working closely with Ontario, the province with the vast majority of seasonal farm workers. But the Premier says testing has been a challenge. I understand the farmers are nervous, the, the workers are nervous. They get tested, they don't get paid. So uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure we connect everyone together. A testing centre was set up last week. And today, plans announced to expand an isolation centre at a local motel for migrants who get positive results. But now, Mexico is considering stopping some seasonal farm workers from coming to Canada. Just seen Trudeau. Still, Mexico's president posted a video thanking Trudeau for expressing condolences and offered reassurance the relationship between the two countries remains strong. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. As the UK begins to open up, concerns still loom around COVID-19. But according to a new report, the virus hasn't affected everyone the same way. Rene Filipponi tells us about revelations of racism's role in the way Britain's health system treated coronavirus. The lockdown in London is lifting, life returning to the streets. But for many of the people driving that return, the COVID-19 risks are heightened. It proved deadly for care worker Joyce Davis, her family says she worried about protection from the virus. She did feel exposed. And we know that these are the lower end of the scale, lower paid, lower, lower everything. And these are where you'll find most black and ethnic minority people. Why is that? 
It's been widely reported that black, Asian and ethnic minorities are dying at disproportionately higher rates. But the report today, held back by the government for weeks, revealed racism is partly to blame. It says racialized people may not access care because of a lack of trust in the system and that health care workers are less likely to seek out the protection they need. The report recommendations include detailed data collection on race, more culturally targeted education campaigns, and better occupational risk assessments. This medical expert suggests that could even lead to some health care workers being reassigned. Maybe you could do some remote uh, consultations that we, we are doing, or put people into green ward, which are COVID-free ward. This is an historic moment, a, an awful crisis. We have to seize this to look at those deep-seated inequalities that this disease has laid bare and have fundamental change. The UK government has promised action, but it's unclear when and what changes are coming to make life safer for so many. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. COVID-19's physical impact, while still serious, is rolling back, but the mental toll may be slower to recede. Researchers at Canada's top psychiatric hospital are studying the virus's effect. Ioana Rumiliotis shares some of what they've found. The sun and the song might have something to do with it. Deandra Henry says everything just feels lighter. As I'm getting outside more, as I'm seeing more people, I definitely feel less anxiousness right now. New research suggests Canadians in general are feeling that way, compared to even just a few weeks ago. I was scared to go outside for the first few weeks for sure, but I'm definitely feeling a lot better now. It has been an invisible pandemic, the mental health toll, and why Canada's leading mental health hospital is trying to track it. CAMH is analyzing surveys of 2,000 people taken since early May. So far, it's found a drop in moderate to severe anxiety, 21%, compared to 25% three weeks ago. Other markers, from binge drinking to depression, hover at similar rates. It's possible that people are really adjusting to the pandemic and they're getting more um, relaxed and less stressed. Adjusting was tough for Stacey Ann Buchanan. She's battled anxiety for years and always managed it by keeping busy as an actress and a mental health activist. And here I am being forced to just sit still and not do anything. Buchanan says the sudden halt forced her to go inward. Her daughter also helped keep her afloat. I find myself in a different space that is a bit more peaceful. The hope is that will be the case for most Canadians, but there are still many worries, from financial uncertainty to fears of using public transit. People are worried about how they're going to return to work, when they're going to return to work. It's absolutely essential that we, we look into the future and monitor patterns um, uh, as this pandemic evolves. CAMH intends to keep collecting data and keep pointing the way towards help and signal the road out of this is still a long one. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome news tonight for BC restaurants and bars hit hard during the pandemic. Coming up, reaction from the industry to a big shift in liquor pricing by the provincial government. Stay with us. It's time to make your voice heard. CBC British Columbia is hosting a virtual town hall to discuss racism, and we want to hear from you. It's a global thing. Just because I was an Asian. Things like this should not exist. But they need to hear our voices. Send us your thoughts and stories by heading to cbc.ca slash racism town hall. Unmasking racism, June 17th at 7 p.m. Tune in on CBC Radio 1, Facebook Live, and on GEM. Fifty years ago, about 2,000 unemployed people boarded a train in Vancouver. It was the height of the Great Depression, and they were desperate for work. They wanted to go and tell that to the Prime Minister in Ottawa, but they never got there. Police in Regina attacked them and forced them to turn back. 
Now, some of those who took part in that 1930s trek are trekking to Ottawa again, but this time, they're not roughing it. Last time we all had a, a little sax on our back with a life savings in there, 2,000 of us, and we rode dirty old freight trains. This time, as they say, we're riding in the plane. And this time, there are only 11 on to Ottawa trekkers, including three men who made the journey 50 years ago and three people who are unemployed today. They say the message they have for Ottawa is the same as the message in 1935. After 50 years under a society that can't do anything more than revert back to the same sort of things where we have to fight 50 years later for working wages and bloody disgrace. Crisis unemployment cannot continue and that something has to be done to create jobs for the unemployed people in this country. If we'd have put our, our uh, signs in mothballs 50 years ago, we could have dug them out now and in the same demands fit today as they did then. There's no difference. Except end of the relief camps, we got rid of that. It was the relief camps of the dirty 30s that led to the first on to Ottawa trek. The camps were set up by the then conservative Prime Minister R.B. Bennett for the thousands of men who wandered the country searching for work. They offered hard labor for slave wages, 20 cents a day. With support from the Communist Party of Canada, the men formed a relief workers' union, went on strike, and boarded the train for Ottawa to take their demands for work and wages straight to the Prime Minister. But they only got as far as Regina. There, they were attacked by police with tear gas, riot sticks, and guns. Some say the police had orders from Ottawa to do anything possible to stop the trekkers from moving east. The trekkers didn't make it to Ottawa, but a few months later, R.B. Bennett's government was defeated and the relief camps were abolished. I got out of there. On Saturday, survivors of the first on to Ottawa trek met to reminisce and to raise money for today's trek. I don't think any one of us under this present day system, and particularly the young people, should feel ashamed and should hide the fact they're unemployed. But we should be terribly goddamned ashamed if we don't do anything about it. So 50 years later, the Trekkers are on their way to Ottawa again. They'll stop in Calgary and Regina along the way, and they hope to meet the Prime Minister in Ottawa on Saturday. Catherine Wright, CBC News, Vancouver. And that's the National. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. And I say, where do I go? They say, just not here. That's their answer for me. That's their solution. Go anywhere, but not here, right? Dozens of VPD officers moved in to clear a tent city near Crab Park on Vancouver's waterfront early this morning. That forced the campers to move their community to another park a few kilometers away. This all comes after a Supreme Court injunction granted to the Port Authority last week, ordering campers to leave. This is extremely frustrating. It's most frustrating for the family members and the residents. I really do feel for them. BC's seniors advocate is hoping visitors will be welcome in long-term care homes soon. She says while coronavirus is still a risk, there are also risks with keeping families apart. Bars and restaurants in B.C. will soon get cheaper prices on the liquor they buy. The hard-hit industry is welcoming the policy change during the pandemic. Wholesale prices, the same that private liquor stores get from the distribution branch, are about 20% cheaper than retail. And for most restaurants, liquor sales make up about 30% of revenue. And joining us now live via Skype is Ian Tostenson, president of the B.C. Restaurant and Food Services Association. Uh, Ian, first off, uh, your reaction to these pricing changes. Well, good evening, Mike. This is probably uh, one of the biggest days in liquor reform in British Columbia in the history of liquor in British Columbia. Um, you know, typically in Canada, there were no discounts given to anybody and certainly not to restaurants. They were viewed as not necessary. And we've been working on this issue for probably three years, four years, five years with the previous government. But it's been the last two years that there's been a lot of intensity around this with, with uh, Minister Eby, who I give all the credit to 
to uh, move this across the line for us. Okay, and what are you hearing from your members tonight? What's this uh, possibly going to mean for them? Well, you're talking about a 20% reduction, which could be significant. So in one case, a restaurant group that has four restaurants could save, uh, maybe see savings of $200,000. And other restaurants said, I can hire 50 employees back. So the type of email we're getting tonight is, this is probably going to make the difference between whether I close forever or I have some hope of making it through to the next stage. It's very significant. It's very timely. It's, uh, it's an economic stimulus for the industry that is, the timing couldn't be perfect. And um, you know, you'll see uh, this will help the uh, restaurants recover some of the, the investments they've had to make to reopen their restaurants. They had a lot of expenses of plexiglass and hiring their staff again. So it's really a wonderful day for our industry in BC. Indeed. So uh, what about restaurant and bar patrons, Ian? I mean, is a bottle of wine, a, a pint of beer going to be any cheaper because of this? Well, Mike, I think eventually it will be. But, you know, we're encouraging industry right now to, they have no cash, they have no money. They've been out of business for, you know, almost three months plus. So um, I think the difference here is that the, you'll see them investing this money back into their businesses to keep their businesses open and therefore be able to hire and to hopefully grow and not close and all those ramifications. In six months, if we stabilize, this is very much like a triage situation in a hospital. But I think in six months as we stabilize, then I think you're going to see that restaurants will start to put some of that value back uh, to their guests. But you know what? Restaurants are always about value. You're always going to find something. They're very conscious of you know, their, their, their guests and the value proposition that they bring to the table. But wouldn't uh, discounting liquor prices e even a little bit perhaps encourage more people to, uh, to come back in and, and patronize the establishment? No, right now it's not about discounting, Mike. It's about the experience. It's about being able to get back out in a restaurant. And I'm sure some restaurants will say, you know what, we have a glass of wine tonight, we'll lower the price. Um, that's all good fun, but we're trying to encourage the restaurant. You know, they have no money right now. They have no cash, and so they really need this extra margin. And so um, in time you'll see that. But I think right now, um, you know, judging from what we need, this is the difference, as I said, between some people closing and opening. And I think they just need to have a few months to settle their revenues and get stable because uh, there was a survey out last week that's showing that six out of 10 restaurants are not making any money in, under the current circumstances. And we're still operating at about a 50% capacity. So it's going to take some time. Ian, thanks very much for doing this tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Take care. He's a household name and his body break spots, well, they're legendary. But now Hal Johnson has revealed that racism almost stopped him from getting on TV. At 6.36 Tuesday evening, gorgeous night here on the South Coast. Finally, some blue sky and sunshine today. Tomorrow's looking even better. The rise in temperature is going to continue, but well, for how long? Red will tell us.
it's time to make your voice heard. CBC British Columbia is hosting a virtual town hall to discuss racism. Unmasking racism, June 17th at 7 p.m. Streaming on Facebook, CBC Gem and cbc.ca slash bc. The weather update is brought to you by WorkSafe BC. Visit WorkSafeBC.com for workplace health and safety resources, including COVID-19 prevention. Last check in tonight with meteorologist Brett Soderholm. Brett, uh, I gotta say I'm pretty happy and I feel like I'm gonna be pretty happy for the next few days. <laughs> I was thinking about you specifically, Anita, today when the sun came out and knowing that my forecast panned out, I was hoping you'd have a <laughs> smile on your face. And you should likely be able to keep that going for the next couple of days because sunshine is still going to be our dominant story here in Vancouver all the way for the next, I would say, 48 hours or so. I do want to address something, though. Across the province, there are a few areas that are expected to get a little bit of unsettled weather. And if I could show you that right now. Right now, of course, though, not going to be anywhere on the south coast of Vancouver Island looking rather dry. But if we go into the interior, I want to mention there is the risk for some isolated thunder showers tomorrow afternoon for places like the Thompson, the Okanagan and the Kootenai. So those green blobs you're seeing there, that's just indicative of a little bit of instability which could lead to an isolated thunder shower. Farther to the north though for the north coast like Haida Gwaii and Prince Rupert, we're going to be dealing with some heavier showers essentially Wednesday overnight through to Thursday. But notice over to the northeast into the Peace region, we are not seeing anything and this is really good news because of all of the rainfall that did fall over the past couple of days, we're finally going to get into a drier pattern and that means places like Fort Nelson and Dawson Creek are going to be able to dry out quite nicely after about approximately 100 millimeters of rain has fallen in some areas. Now farther to the south we're going to see a noticeable increase in temperatures as well for places into the Thompson and the Okanagan like Kamloops and Kelowna and you can see Vancouver and even Port Alberni on Vancouver Island likely to be getting into the mid to upper 20s by about Thursday. So really good confidence in this forecast here because this area of high pressure is going to be dominating over the southern half of BC for the next 48 hours or so but hot on its heels from Thursday overnight into Friday we're going to be dealing with another system making its way in yes you guessed it probably for Saturday this time around on the weekend but Saturday is also an interesting day because this is going to be the summer solstice this is when the earth the northern hemisphere is going to be tilted closest to the sun and that's of course because it's tilted at 23.5 degrees but that will make it the longest day of the year and that means we can be expecting about 16 hours hours of daylight, even though it may not necessarily be sunny the entire day. So we are still looking, though, at temperatures getting into the upper teens, the low 20s from now until essentially Friday. And even though a few showers are expected on Saturday, Mike, I apologize in advance for that, it will still feel relatively mild. So temperatures still into the low 20s all the way until next week. All right. Well, we'll settle for the mild part at least. Thanks, Brett. Well, Hal Johnson is a household name synonymous with Body Break, a well-known health and fitness segment he hosted with his wife for more than 30 years. But as CBC National host Andrew Chang tells us, Johnson posted a deeply personal YouTube video today where he describes the racism he faced early in his career and how he triumphed over it. You think that Body Break was started because of fitness. Well, it wasn't. It was started to combat racism. It happened back in you know, April of 1988, and I was wanted to be a sports reporter, and I went to TSN, and they were very open to see me. I went in and submitted my tape. They loved it. He got the job, but only briefly. At 2 o'clock that afternoon, I got a phone call, and he said, uh, sorry, but the higher-ups said, because I'm black and because they already have a black reporter, they don't want to have two black reporters. A few months later, another brush with racism, this time on a commercial shoot. And I just you know, tapped him on the shoulder and I asked him, why did you switch the two of us? And he said, well, and he laughed. <laughs> he said, well, the client really didn't want you next to the white girl because, you know, and, you know, God forbid, somebody might think you're with, uh, with the white girl. Johnson didn't get mad, he got inspired. Eventually, he and McLeod came up with Body Break, an inclusive fitness program for Canadians of all races and backgrounds. They pitched it to TSN, who said this. The problem is uh, you're black and the young lady, I remember him saying, the young lady is white. And so we don't think the Canadian public is ready for a black and white couple together. Today, in a statement, TSN apologized to Johnson for the racism he experienced and said it recognizes there's still much to do. That's CBC National host Andrew Chang.
The idea that racism is embedded in society is now at the forefront. It's prompted former Governor, Governor General, rather, Mikhail Jean, to reveal her experiences. Host of CBC News Power and Politics, Vashi Capello, spoke to Jean earlier today. She opened up about Canadian leadership now and her own past at Radio Canada. Mikhail Jean doesn't mince words on systemic racism in Canada. But the denial becomes part, you know, of the problem. Jean, the first and only black governor general in this country's history, is reacting to recent and very public struggles with both the definition of systemic racism and the admission it exists. From the commissioner of the RCMP. I, I've honestly heard about 15 or 20 definitions of systemic racism. To the premier of Quebec. And I don't see a system, an organized system. He comes from the private sector. Hasn't he noticed that in some occasions on, I mean, boardrooms or, or events, you know, bringing together the business community, sometimes there was probably one black person in the room. Doesn't that speak loudly of the situation? I mean, and, and not taking the time to, to listen, not taking the time to even um, engage in a conversation to share how people who are affected by it live it is, I find, to, to an extent, very irresponsible. Jean says she's lived it many times, including when she interviewed for a job at Radio Canada, the French language service of the CBC. It was really conducted on the basis of my race. They were asking me, you know, do you think you can really integrate? And, I, and on, on purpose, you know, I forced that person to repeat that question several times because I just pretended I, I, I didn't understand. And, and, and then, you know, he lost patience and he said, well, you have to realize you'll be the first black person in the newsroom. <laughs> so I stood and I said, you know what? I think we're going to stop that conversation right here. I think there's a problem and I'm not a problem. The problem is on your side. Jean says that's just one of many examples throughout her life, experiences that underscore why she says Legault is wrong. But she's hopeful things are changing. We've had enough of this. Vashi Capellos, CBC News, Ottawa. U.S. President Donald Trump signed an executive order today introducing several police reforms. It comes during weeks of protests sparked by the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. As Katie Simpson tells us, critics say the new measures don't truly address the problem. And a warning, there are some scenes in this report some viewers may find upsetting. The president defended police as he introduced his executive order that aims to improve accountability and raise standards in policing. It's the first move from the White House after demands for change exploded across the country following the killing of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis and on Friday, the shooting death of Rayshard Brooks by an officer in Atlanta. The order provides financial incentives for police departments to participate in certified training. Chokeholds are banned, except when an officer believes his or her life is in danger. And it creates a national database to track officers who've been disciplined for inappropriate behavior. I can't breathe. Stop resisting. I can't breathe, please. Donald Trump said the number of problem officers in the U.S. is tiny and leaned into what will be part of his re-election message, presenting himself as tough on crime. Americans want law and order. They demand law and order. They may not say it. They may not be talking about it, but that's what they want. Some of them don't even know that's what they want, but that's what they want. And they understand that when you remove the police, you hurt those who have the least the most. The order does not require cities or states to reallocate funds from police departments to other community services, which is what many of the protesters have been demanding, using the phrase defund police as their rallying cry. Trump spoke for nearly 30 minutes, covering a wide range of issues. He once again condemned protesters, encouraging cities and states to call in the National Guard to stop looting. He also accused his predecessor, former President Barack Obama, and his vice president, Joe Biden, of not doing anything to tackle police reform, saying they didn't know what to do. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. And tomorrow we'll find out if Justin Trudeau's campaign to get Canada a seat on the UN Security Council has been successful.
A competition, Norway and Ireland. Salima Shivji reports on the hurdles Canada has to overcome. Any challenge can be met if we meet it together. A goal close to the Prime Minister's heart. Having a Canadian voice at that table. The campaign pushed ahead when a global pandemic made these tactics impossible. I also want to thank everyone who joined us today. Virtual diplomacy. <laughs> replacing free Celine Dion tickets to charm diplomats. Justin Trudeau has personally chatted up more than 40 world leaders, from Senegal to St. Kitts. The focus, votes in Africa and the Americas, leaning into francophonie and Commonwealth ties. The message, global cooperation, is needed now more than ever, and Canada is big enough to help, but small enough to understand. Message received in Barbados. The common platform of values helps us to agree on most things. And we as a country have made a very clear determination that we will be supporting your country. We see you as family. One vote out of 129 needed in a tight race with voting kept secret. A significant number of UN members vote purely on the whim of their ambassadors in New York. And those ambassadors often promise their votes to all three candidates. And no one is quite sure who is telling the truth to whom. Norway spends more on foreign aid, Ireland is more committed to peacekeeping. And Canada has had to fend off criticism, its votes on the Middle East skew pro-Israel. The Prime Minister's message is consistent, a seat at this table means influence. Regardless of what happens in the campaign, uh, we are more engaged and we will continue to be more engaged on the world stage. That may be laying the groundwork for defeat, even if the official word is still cautious optimism. The push is frantic to avoid what would be seen as a blow to this government. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, COVID-19 has many of us practicing physical distancing, isolating, and well, with some free time on our hands. Why that led to a shortage in puzzles. We'll put that story together next. CBC British Columbia is hosting a virtual town hall to discuss racism. Send us your thoughts and stories by heading to cbc.ca slash racism town hall. Unmasking racism, June 17th at 7 p.m.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC BC is hosting a digital town hall looking at the disturbing increase in racism across the province. Join in the dialogue on June 17th at 7 p.m. Learn more at cbc.ca slash racism town hall. And CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of the Doxa Documentary Film Fest. This year it's moving online. Enjoy amazing films and digital live events from the comfort of your own home. I think it's fair to say that everybody loves a good puzzle, right? You know, popular pastime, but even more so now. How often have you heard this? Many people staying home uh, more during COVID-19 and finding their puzzles. As Taylor Simmons tells us, two Toronto companies have pieced together a plan for local businesses to cash in. We were having some requests for, for puzzle production, a lot more than we normally do and started to kind of look into it and see there is really a shortage of puzzles. And we kind of keyed in on the idea of the images of the puzzle are usually the most generic, boring part of a puzzle. So the idea of swapping out that image for an image of something that you really care about, like the small businesses that you miss and that you're used to going to, um, yeah, it seemed like, like, like a great marriage. And so We Piece Together was born. It's a project started by Flash Reproductions and Frontier Design to support local businesses and artists. We have employees here who are, have subsidized wages, but they still don't have a lot of work to do. It just seems like, what's the point of any of this if we're sitting here idle when other people are hurting and we have the tools to help? To take part, businesses just have to upload a photo to the Piece Together website, then $15 from every puzzle sold goes directly to the business. They already have about 50 businesses on board, places like Cameron House, the Junction BIA, and Shacklin's Brewing. I was just so happy to see this initiative that, uh, I mean, yeah, the money is going to be a good thing, but just the community, building a network between if you notice, it's, it's a bunch of different people. It's 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 a you know it's a brewery, it's bars, it's 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 like a yoga. You know, I just like the idea of community building. Poppet says the response to the project is positive and growing. After just two weeks, they've printed hundreds of puzzles, one by one, helping to piece the city back together. Why wouldn't you be that much more interested to to do a puzzle that is actually making a difference? You know. Taylor Simmons, CBC News, Toronto. Love to see everyone doing their part. And gotta say, I've been working on a puzzle for a good year. What? It's a really nice world map, and I just can't <laughs> get the the water. It's all blue. You can't oh, right. get the pieces well, do you, right. Do you, do you have the strategy of you do the the, cor the edging first, the corners, the sides? In this case, the edging is impossible because it's all blue water too. It's oh. just it's not a good. Yeah. But you I got the it colors together, and it all works out. You can spend hours and, and hours. And a lot of people are these days. <laughs> I'll, maybe I'll have to have you over to finish oh, it. All right, all right. Uh, back to the puzzles, everybody. We're out of here, and Dan's in at uh, 11 right after the National. Good night.